Why, hello folks, old Buster coming to you again. Got another story. Name of this one's called Assets. Part 1. Captain, wake up. You're a hollering so to wake the day. You saying spooks or what? Well, Jesse told Buster it twarn't nothing except in him a dreaming. Well, Buster said he reckoned it was a nightmare because he was a talking in his in sleep and then began to a holler. What was you riling up you so much there, Captain? Some kind of monster or chasing you? Got you all riled up? Well, the captain says to Buster, it was really them dang oddism Obama nights down in Foggy Bottoms along the old river that was a chasing him. They was a trying to get all their money and holdings and I was a running from them, says the captain to Buster. Well, Buster told the captain that he would rustle up some grub and make a good strong pot of coffee whilst he put on his boots. Well, Buster and the captain was on a little trip to tend to business, as the captain put it. Buster put down the queen on a little grass strip in Florida along the coast and they just decided to camp there for the night as they was a leaving early the next morning. Now the captain had been a studying on what all to do with all their assets and he was going to meet up with some fellers he knowed from Europe and Switzerland on the island of Zuma in the Bahamas. It was just a 90 minute flight from Florida. They all was going to stay at the Peace and Plenty and noon over to Stockton Island across the bay for privacy. Well, the boys had plenty of money. They didn't have to sleep on the ground out there, them sand fleas or nothing, but they liked to camp out and they were country boys and been on the bio for so long. Wasn't nothing for them. They still had good sense, you know. She didn't let that money go to their head. Walter and Hired was at the chuck wagon races over in Clinton, Arkansas. Walter had fixed his himself up a honest to goodness real life chuck wagon and done taught them two grays of his to pull it. Old Stoney and Smokey was a mite fast and Walter said they stood a heck of a good chance of winning the whole darn kit and caboodle. Well, depending on how things turned out and all, Walter and Hired was going to meet up with Buster and the captain when the races was over. Turned out Walter come in second when Old Stoney throwed the shoe. Wasn't his fault, you know. After they was loaded and headed on back to the teacup, Walter told that's the ranch Walter had. Told Hired he was going to spend the evening with Lou Ann before they left on out and that Hired needed to take Alma May to supper too. Well, all the boys been gone off and on for a spell with business and all and the gals needed a little tension. Hired reckoned they ought to hate on out by dinner and would pick up Walter when he uh, went to get the plane ready out the hangar. Well, Belle was there in the new plane the boys just bought. She was a beaut and fast. This one was a jet. The captain picked her up all pretty much at a fire sale. She was a F-18A, uh, B, a B, a F-18B because they make an A, but that's one pilot and a B has two seats in it for someone else sitting in there. She was a F-18B fighter jet but could carry two, the pilot and a co-pilot or a passenger, even though the F-A-18B was primarily used for training. Now, Mr. Holmes helped the captain outfit her with a few upgrades and a trick or two. The captain was gumming around and found the plane had been auctioned off with a asking price of $175,000. Now, you can believe that, and this was a real true thing. The captain got her for $150,000, and Hired was the first to get checked out in her. Now, Buster had just finished his training and checkout flight before him and the captain left out to Exuma. Now that dang hired was like a kid in the candy store with the airplane and doing tricks and the carrying on. Old Walter was <laughs> he was in for a big surprise of riding with hired, I'm telling you. This was the first time Walter would ride in the F-18 and he was a bit skittish but hired said he would take it easy on him. Of course, hired had his and fingers crossed behind his and back when he said that. Now whilst Buster and the captain was waiting on Walter and hired, they done their business with the finance and investment fellers, the captain note. They had a right night set tea on the beach with a bang up dinner with all the trimmings and a little old McBrayer to top off the meal. Excuse me folks. <coughs> a little sign of here. Well the captain got right on down to business. Boy was he a talking turkey with him. The captain was a mite younger than them fellers but was more than holding his and own. Whatever the captain was a doing, Buster had no ID. They all trusted him, whatever he did in business now. Walter, Hired, and Buster just let the captain handle all their financial dealings. 
Oh, they had a fair idea what all was going on, but not all the details, and didn't want to know them if they could. Fact is, they just didn't give a hoot and trusted the captain whatever he done. He loved that kind of stuff. Well, the next morning, the captain took Buster for a ride around the island, showing him the lay of the land. The captain asked Buster what he thought of a spot where they stopped, and Buster declared is one of the prettiest places he'd ever seen. Well, it's all ours, Buster. All the boys own 94 acres right on the ocean. Well, Buster asked the captain how in the world he done that. Well, he said he got it in a deal and took it instead of cash. We got more than that, too. Well, you don't say, exclaimed Buster. You sure enough been doing some dealing. I'm here to tell you, Captain. Well, the Captain just up and grinned like a possum eating green persimmons and said it sure is fun doing business. Well, Captain, what you got planned for this place, asked Buster. Well, the Captain said we ought to just build us four houses on the property and give us all plenty of room to spread out and just leave the rest like it is. It sure enough sounds like a plan to me, Captain. I know Walter and Hyde will love the place and that ID too. You know, they ought to be pulling in about now. If an I know hired, Walter's going to be green around the gills with his and tricks and all. Walter's going to be fit to be tied. Remember that Lamborghini, Captain? Well, Buster just busted out of laughing and the Captain joined in on that. Captain, we got to give her a name. I've been a ciphering on it and I think we ought to call her Star. I think that's a real fine name for her, Buster. I bet old Hired and Walter will like it too. Something else, Captain. We just got to get us a jet plane big enough for all our families to go on trips with us. Well, I've been figuring on that myself, Buster. In my getting around, I'll be on the lookout for us a good one. The captain done told Buster, I got a line on one or two that just might work out. We'll just have to wait and see. Now, I know Hire and Walter would be tickled plink over that too, said Buster. I even got a name picked out for her when we get her and, and uh, while Buster was uh, slapping on the captain on the back and picking up in a bear hug. When Buster and the captain got back to the peace and plenty, it was getting nigh on to supper time. Walter and Hyde was there waiting, and sure enough, Walter was a bit peaked now, green around the gills. Green around them gills. Boy, Hyde could do it to him. Hyde was a kind of keeping his in distance and a grinning like a cat that ate the canary. Well, Buster says to Walter, now, don't go sullen up. We got things to do tomorrow. He grabbed his old neck and hugged him up. Him was trying to get in the way. Walter muddled something, mumbled something about he weren't going to ride in that dang machine there another time with hired to fly it. He was going to fly back with Buster and the Queen. Well, Buster told the boys he doesn't give the new name a plane a name, Star. Well, all of them thought that was a right fine name with Walter saying she was fast as a shooting star. That's for sure. Fast as green's lightning, piped up higher just a laughing. Well, the captain told Walter and hired about all of them owning the 94 acres, and they began to cackling like hens of making plans for their houses. Buster also told them the captain was looking into a plane big enough for all the families. The captain gave them all a little rundown on their holdings and net worth and what all he was figuring on to doing. Buying their own bank automating and updating old McBrayer in Kentuck and doing some things for Aunt Judith and Elizabeth Jane. Of course all the boys families were took care of but the captain said they needed to think of getting off the grid and going green whatever that meant. He done found a deal on the subdivision was going to start up a tater chips factory and a winery. All of them organic. The big deal was in mining gold, silver and platinum along with the bank he was going to buy them. All manner of plans was in the captain's hate, and the boys said to get her done, they was in for the ride. They say ride the rocket. Well, one thing the captain done was set up a non-profit to help folks who couldn't help themselves. Not being any of their fault, you know. Being blessed like they was, they ought to give back. Well, all of them agreed 100% on that. Big business and some fun to Mari boys, said the captain. How about a little nip before we turn in? Well, all the boys lifted their glasses and the captain said, to gold. Well, the captain done saved the best for last, and this ain't no joke, boys. This place, for true, was really for sale. And uh, 
Some of these things I tell you is true in this story, and some ain't. Like that plane that could have bought it for 175000 This decommissioned missile site, it was 1874 North Bantam Road, Othello, Washington. It sold for $3 million. This is a decommissioned military Titan I missile complex we done bought for $3 million in Othello, Washington, about three hours east of Seattle. Now, just tell you a little bit about this place. I generally don't like to read all these statistics and stuff, but I'm going to read you about this thing that was bought. And this is also, you can look on the internet and see these boys building these safe places underground <clears throat> that's all self-contained and self-sustainable. Well, this one had a front door that's a two-ton hatch that leads down six flights of stairs to a network of subterranean rooms and tunnels that all connect to a 125-foot diameter super dome with a 65-foot ceiling. Now, 18 Titan One missile sites were built during the years of 59 to 62 between Colorado and Washington State. This one has three underground missile silos that measure 160 foot deep and 40 foot wide. Now, this site can withstand and survive any nuclear blast. Now, 20 years ago, a man purchased this property from the government and intended to turn it to a youth camp but he died before he could realize his and drain. We got our own private well, generator power, and can live off the grid. Now she ain't much to look at, but this beauty was built to last. <clears throat> we also got us a private bank charter from down New Orleans. Uh, way, but we ain't going to keep our gold and precious metals there, that's for sure. Right here is where. Plus this old Place is a right safe place for iron families in case of emergency. Mighty fine hidey ho. If and you ask me, said the captain, what y'all think about that idea? Well, sir, the boys was all bum fuzzled, but sure enough liked the way the captain was a thinking. The captain said he about had all the details worked out. And Monique would take care of the bank in New Orleans and with the folks he knowed, and our friend Jenny would oversee the whole shebang. Now, the gold split up. You remember one story that had seven times they figured of what was in the world more than the rest of the world. Now Jim Rogers place, that's where most of it was. But there's some in that bank in New Orleans they bought. But in this missile silo, well it took uh, more than act of Congress. Only Jesus Christ could get that gold out of there. Well they got gold there too. Anyway, back on with it. The captain said he was going to have to do a little traveling pretty soon to meet with his and contacts in person to line up everything, but figured it wouldn't take no time to talk. Well, they all agreed to keep this a secret and fix up the place right, cozy-like, and would take a little trip up there when they left out of Exuma. Now, the captain said he wanted all the boys to go with him to see Jim Rogers at the mountain and Aunt Judith, too. They also needed to meet up with Leonard Banks and Bill and Paul to kick off his and plan. It would be real good to see the crusher, because it had been quite a spell except for phone calls. You know, Leonard, the crusher, Banks. Well, let's go have a little fun before we leave out, boys. Time's a wasting, said the captain. Make some plans, boys. We got people to see, places to go, and things to do. The captain jumped on his jet ski and hated for Stocking Island. Well, the boys stayed a couple more days, peace and plenty, and just piled around eating and diving and doing all the things the body would do at the ocean. Of course, the captain had to do a little business and all whilst the boys called home and made arrangements to be gone for a bit. The captain told all the gals that he had a little surprise for them in Costa Rica where they owned a piece of a spa and they was to gather up and have a good time for the week. Now, the malls of the boys ain't never seen the like, so the gals had to do a little convincing. The Pauls were just going to have to batch it for the week. Well, all the sisters was a-going too, so the men folk had to fend for themselves. If the truth be told, fishing was on their list, and it was high time to get away from working so dang hard. All the crops was laid by, and there was plenty of hired help, so why not? All in all, everything worked out just fine. The boys all left out after staying on for another couple of days just to having some fun together. It had been a spell since they'd done that, and they all really enjoyed the time together. Walter got back at hired when they was a diving by putting a sea cucumber down his swimming togs. That got hired to wiggling like a worm and hot ashes, I tell you. 
especially down about 65 foot and on a shark dive at that. It was all safe enough, but all of them had to surface because of laughing so darn hard. Now Walter was true to his word, he didn't ride back with hired in the star, but he did in the Queen. Well Buster wanted to fly star back to the house and the captain said he had to be back fast before they left on out on their trip. So Hired flew Walter back home nice and slow, like whilst Buster hit the afterburner and broke the sound barrier with the captain. Now when Buster landed Star at the airport, they got Buster's Ford and went on home. And the captain said he would see him tomorrow sometime after a little business he had to tend to. And by that time, Walter and Hired would be back and about ready to leave on out. The boys spent the next day of preparing to make their trip and tell the gals goodbye. The captain seed the boys the next evening over at Buster's grandma's where all the folks gathered up for supper. That was a nice time with everybody having plenty of what they wanted to eat and visiting and little hair of the dog. The captain said they'd leave right after dinner the next day and told them all to pack up the gear and ask if and Buster would pick them all up in his and Ford. Buster said that was a plan. When Buster fetched all the boys, the captain told Buster to drive to the far end of the airport where all them fancy private corporate jets was parked. Well, all the boys would have wondered what in the heck the captain was a doing and a talking about. Well, sir, the captain had Buster pull right up to a couple of planes sitting there, pretty as you please. One was a 1974 Boeing 727EX, and the other was a 1981 Falcon 50. Both of them had serious updates, but especially a big turlet for Buster. Now, the Duchess could carry all their families and friends wherever they wanted to go in the world. A lady was sure enough a plane that could get eight or nine folks anywhere too, but was most generally used for the boys and quick trips. The captain said he bought the Duchess out of Ethiopia. They were asking 300000 for her, but she had been a-sitting for about five years over a dispute about a bill. The captain got her for $217,000 and had her refurbished and customized. He spent about another two and a half million or so doing that, and that was still cheap at half the price. Well, Lady didn't take too much fixing, and he got her for $3.2 million. The captain said we had every kind of a plane we would ever need, and we sure did need them, and with all everything and what all we was into. Now, two pilots was hired for a bit, and on call if we needed them, but the captain had a suggestion for all the boys. Seeing how hired and Buster could fly about anything, all of them could take off any time, but if there was an emergency, there wouldn't be nobody to take one of their places. So he reckoned all of us needed to learn eight to fly all our planes. Now old Walter strained a bit when it come to star, but calmed down a bit when the captain said he would get an instructor for him to ride with instead of hired. Well Buster and Hired could start learn eight and Walter and the captain ride off on flying and sooner or later they would get the hang of it before they tested for the license. The two pilots that was hired would check out Buster and Hired in both planes on the trip and then would take the Duchess on back home and Buster and Hired could do the flying and the lady from then on. The captain said we was going to build our own hangars for our planes and a little strip too on that piece of ground he done found. He said we had the money and we needed the tax deduction anyhow. Belle, Queen, Lady and the Duchess could all be ready to go at a moment's notice just like the star. Hired said he was getting himself a couple of new toys and would stick them out there too. A helicopter and an ultralight was what he was a figuring on. Well, Hired had to have everything at fly. Well, the captain set us all down right there in the Duchess with a mighty old McBrayer and told us that if in this here trip went off like he'd planned, they just didn't have no idea what they would be worth and being liquid too. He also said he had been a talking to Mr. Holmes and there was a possibility of some fireworks over all this. Mr. Hiram said he'd be watching over things whilst they was gone and Dalton and Devane along with Uncle Jeff would be on standby if they needed it. Walter piped up and said this looks like an opportunity boys. If for nothing else, one heck of an adventure and we've been on a few. Hired said it ain't like we need another or ain't had none. Now, all of them cackled over that for sure. Well, Buster uh, hollered out for the pilots Rob and Jake to come on board and be introduced and give them the plan. Buster was to fly the Duchess with one pilot and hired to fly the lady with the other pilot. 
The captain was going to ride with Hired and Jake to start his learning and Walter and Buster and Rob to begin his. The captain told Buster what all they had done for the boys and to check the markings on the planes. The emblem on each plane was of four crests, one for each of the boys' family in a diamond. Everything from now on would have each crest and what belonged to each one of the boys too, like their motorcycles. The emblem would be on their plates and glasses and towels and linens and whatever else they jointly owned, ties, neckties if you wore them, and jackets and whatnot. The captain asked them if they liked the name of Four Winds. If and they did, that was the name of their new corporation. All the boys were sure enough happy and excited about all the things the captain had done along with Buster's help. The vote was unanimous. Four wins it was. The first stop was Kentucky. They landed at Mount Sterling Montgomery Airport later that afternoon and called a aid for Elizabeth Jane to pick them up. She and Aunt Judith both come to fetch the boys and there was a mite of hugging and a kissing and a tear or two shed by the women folk. All the boys said it was sure enough good to be back and they had missed them terrible lot. Maureen and Colleen was back at the house and fixed up a supper fitting for a king. And when the boys all come in, they come a-running and went to hugging and a-kissing them too. Well, over supper, the boys asked Maureen and Colleen how their people was a-doing over in Scotland. They said all was fine, fit as a fiddle, and really did appreciate what the boys had done for them. Not only the trip, but for helping out their kin. It was good that they didn't have to worry none about paying for their places. Times was hard for them over there, but now they could see the light at the end of the tunnel. Well, Aunt Judith told both the McGregor women that they would never have to worry none about money or having a place to stay, that's for sure. Both Maureen and Colleen said that here was their home and they would die right here in this here house. Well, the captain said that he would like for all the women folk to join him and the boys in the parlor for a little old McBrayer and would like to speak to them about something very important. <clears throat> Well, after the dishes was cleared and when Buster polished off the last of the Cairo nut pie and bread pudding, they all adjourned to the parlor. First off, the captain gave Aunt Judith, Elizabeth Jane, and McGregor's a portfolio of their net worth. Well, each one of them looked at their portfolio and then at the captain with their mouths wide open and all bug-eyed. All the women started to telling the captain he must be wrong about this, but he assured them the figures was correct. The captain began to telling everybody about the planes, the place in Washington for an emergency and storage. That's Washington State where the uh, silo was. Their investments and the bank they would buy. He explained that they would have total control over all their assets and all business transactions would go through their bank. That included credit cards, the nonprofit corporation, and any other charitable contributions and investments worldwide. The captain asked if and they all wanted to go along with his plan for the future and providing for all their families and friends. Well, Aunt Judith took Jesse and Buster's hand and looked them square date in the eye and said, Y'all are family and all I got in this world other than Elizabeth Jane. Y'all both have done so much already and have made me a happy woman in these later years of my life. Y'all have my blessing and like a friend of the family once said, be sure you're right and go ahead. Y'all know who that was, Davy Crockett. Then Aunt Judah turned to Walter and Hired and told him that she had two more boys that was like blood kin and them, and she knowed they would do everything in their power not only to help Buster and Jesse, but all their families and friends as well. She dearly loved them all and trusted them with anything she'd got. Now, Elizabeth Jane and McGregor's both agreed with Aunt Judith. Well, Jesse told him he had some papers for him to sign and he'd handle everything. Now you might be just wondering why Buster and the boys called Jesse Captain, but if you remember when they was over in Zambia, Jesse was made a captain in their army. It kind of stuck from then on. Well, Aunt Judith said uh, they was going to have a party and a reunion of their family and friends. The McGregors and Lizzie Jane piped up and said it'd be the biggest and best party ever seen around these here parts. Well, all the family left the parlor, knowing everybody was going to be asked to make a special effort to be there. Elizabeth Jane said she'd make all the arrangements with the gals and not to worry about a thing. Walter said since they had the new planes, they could ferry the folks here from 
wherever they was in the world. All of them was plum tickled with the ID and you could see the women folk already a plotting and a planning. The boy stayed on for a few more days of helping around the place. Walter checked on the stream and took new water samples. It was right as rain and old William McBrayer sure picked a right spot for a distillery finest water to be had. Walter caught up the gray that was on the place and rode the fence line around the farm. He ain't been rode since Walter throwed a leg over him so he was a mite skittish at first. That gray was right frisky when Walter saddled him up but with Walter being the horse whisperer he was had him calm down in no time flat after a buck or two and a good run for a couple miles. Elizabeth Jane and the McGregors had that horse plump sport giving him carrots and apples and sugar cubes. Well, Buster had bought up as much acreage as he could along the way and increased the place to around about 5,000 acres. Buster and Jesse put in as many improvements as they could to make it a self-sufficient operation. The stream provided electricity along with the wind generator and there was plenty of water. Hired help tended to crops and the women folk canned and put up stores for winter and any hard times that might be around the corner. The captain was on the phone and computer as usual but rode out from time to time on a four-wheeler with Buster or Hired or Walter, whichever one was going out, to see how things were running on the place. Buster told Walter and Hired that he thought Jesse was a doing that to give him a piece and he didn't get anywhere else. It had to do with roots, Buster said. Before the boys left, Jesse had a little talk with all the women folk again. He asked them to remember the fracas they had there a while back and said there just might be another with his new plant. He wanted them to know that Mr. Holmes was involved and Dalton and Devane would be checking in on them from time to time along with Walter's Uncle Jeff. Well, Aunt Judith asked how Hiram was doing and Buster said they was all doing fine. Jesse had to go into detail in private with Aunt Judith about B.B. and Monique before he left on out. She wasn't about to have him leaving without him telling what all was going on in his love life and the same for Buster and Hired and Walter. Well, Hired and Walter done told her all about Alma May and Lou Ann so they was good to go. Well, Aunt Judith and Elizabeth Jane took the boys back to the airport after a big old country breakfast on Saturday morning. They said their goodbyes and told them they would be in touch and to let them know when the party was going to be. Buster took the lady with Rob and Hired, uh, with Rob and Hired took the Duchess with Jake and the Captain and Walter took up their learning where they left off on the way to Sand Point, Idaho. Well, when they landed, they knowed if and Marion wasn't in town, there wasn't going to be no way to get in touch with Jim, so they rented a four-wheel drive. The boys checked in town to see if Marion was roundabout, but she wasn't. So they drove on out to the mountain and parked the truck and hoofed it up to the entrance to the cave. Jim and Wolf was waiting on them when they come up. See them a coming five mile out, Jim said. There was a hand shaking, back slapping, and hugging like there was no tomorrow. Jim said that the boys was a sight for sore eyes. Well, Marion was in the cave of fixing them about to eat. She'd fixed up a real good place there since they'd been gone and made some real improvements on security too. Hired rubbed Wolf's ears and asked how the pups was a doing. Pete and Repeat was still with them along with their mama, but the other pups went out on their own. Every once in a while they'd pop up for a visit and a bite to eat, but they was looking to build families of their own, he reckoned. When the boys and Jim got back to the cave, the boys were some kind of amazed what all they'd done to the place. Security was first rate and they found out Mr. Holmes had provided all type of electronics and ways for power and stronger entrance doors and state-of-the-art camouflage. Unless a body just knowed where to look, you could never tell there was a way into that mountain. There was retinal scan, voice print, and fingerprint access to the main door. Escape tunnels was reinforced and secured too. The boy said they never even knowed that Mr. Holmes knowed about Jim, let alone doing all that. Well, Jim said one day Marion was in town and this feller asking if she would give him the time of day for a bit of a chat. She did and Mr. Holmes told her all about the boys and what all they'd done in the past, or as much as he could tell her, and asked if and Jim and her could help out a mite. It was in the best interest of them and the boys and their country if and Jim and her would let him do that. 
Well, Mr. Holmes said everything would be delivered to a location where nobody would know what it was they was a-getting. Now, Mr. Holmes also said he wanted to meet up for supper with the three of the fellers that was dear friends of the boys. One of them, Uncle Jeff, was Walter's uncle. Well, they all met up in Spokane and had supper and discussed what all needed to be done. Dalton said the ham radio set was a perfect ID from the boys for their wedding present, but they wanted to upgrade it with an encryption device to keep their conversation secret. Nobody's business, Devane said. Well, Mr. Holmes said none of them even wanted to go to the mountain, but if any specialist was required, they would make sure he didn't know how he got there and didn't see nothing but what he was working on. Jim said he could take care of most of the work to be done as far as construction, but would need some help with the technical stuff. They got all that accomplished as soon as they could and it turned out just perfect. Jim and Marion were snug as a bug in the rug in their mountain. Now Mr. Holmes had a private and secret conversation with Jim and Marion. They talked about his and gold and the boys and the plan that Jesse and Mr. Holmes had hatched. Mr. Holmes asked Jim and Marion if they'd go along with the boys and him on the plan. Well, Jim and Mary Ann told him without a doubt they would. Heck, part of it was done give to the boys anyhow. Jim said him and Mary Ann had more than enough to last them ten lifetimes. Mr. Holmes said to tell the boys he would meet up with them in Washington after their trip to discuss the plan. Well, the captain was took back some, not ever knowing what to expect from Mr. Holmes. Now he didn't interfere none, but was always there helping out. But Jim told the boys that feller didn't give up much, but he wanted Jim and Marion to know if and he had any youngins, he'd want them to be just like them four boys. Enough said. Well, Jim and Marion know this was a man to be trusted, uh, and them other three was just like him. Jim and Marion was proud as punch over the boys and said it was a blessing from the Lord to have them come into their lives. So in a nutshell, y'all are going to haul out a parcel of gold to the Washington location and leave half of it here. Ain't that right? Plus, Jesse, you and Mr. Holmes is a going to use the mountain as some sort of in-ground asset for bargaining. Ain't that right? Dang it, Jim, you done beat me to the punch. How in the world you got all that figured out, I'll never know, said Jesse. Well, reading between the lines is all, boy, said Jim. Now, where are them papers you want me and Marion to sign up? Supper's getting cold. Of course, after supper, all of them had a little taste of old McBrayer to top off the wonderful and delicious meal Marion fixed for them. Pete and repeat laid on each side of hire, and Wolf was in front of getting petted. Wolf was still daddy and alpha male, so there wasn't no back talk from the youngins. Mama stayed close to Jim and dozed peaceably like. Jim asked the boys where they was hated when they left the mountain, and they told him to Denver to see Leonard. They had to get him to sign on with the plan to make it work along with Bill and Paul. Now the boys stayed for another day of looking over the place and just a visiting. Hired was long gone to the woods with Pete and Repeat and Wolf most of the day. The captain was on his satellite phone talking and sending text messages a good bit of the time whilst Walter and Buster hung out with Jim and Mary until it was time for supper. The roof was a starlit sky. The natural plateau got its access from the hand-hewn steps that Jim made. It was absolutely beautiful and romantic on top of the mountain. A body felt like they could reach up and touch the moon and the stars. Marion had really made a special supper for the boys and set a table next to none up on the plateau. Moon glow and twinkling stars was all the illumination you needed on this incredible night. Well, Jesse said nary a word but just leaned back and looked to the heavens. Walter declared it was a sight to behold and forever a memory. Well, Hired said he was having his himself what they call an epiphany. This experience was truly life-changing. Well, Buster looked at each of them and simply said, God loves us all, and I love y'all. What a grown man won't say, quipped Jim, and grabbed up Buster as big as he was in a bear hug that would have broke a normal man. Marion had tears in her eyes and couldn't say a word. The spread they had was something else. Everybody had their favorite thing to eat. Seemed like Marion had been a cooking for a week. Buster done eat two sweet tater pies his himself plus eight fried peach pies. Jim and Buster had moose steak. Jesse had fresh caught trout. Walter had a beef steak. 
and Buster had pork roast too. They all had all the trimmings they all liked. Marion had the trout along with Jesse. Well, Jim and Marion, like Aunt Judith, just couldn't get used to calling Jesse the captain, so Jesse it was, something for the boys. The boys thanked Jim and Marion profusely and told them about the party and reunion, and they would be in touch now that they had a way to do that. Howard said they would send a plane for them so not to worry none about getting uh, there and back. Well, it was 11.33 a.m. when they landed at the Denver airport. Hired Walter uh, was there, and Hired had Walter to radio ahead to Leonard and tell him they were coming. They were flying, you know. Leonard told him that him and Thomasina would pick them up at the airport, and they could get a bite to eat at the Rattlesnake Club. Well, after all the greeting, they let out for dinner at the restaurant. When they got there, the manager recognized Hired and the boys right off the bat. He said dinner was on him. Ever since they left business at Quadruple, as soon as folks heard they was back in town, there wouldn't be a seat for no price for six months. Now the manager asked if and Hired had any more rattlers with him, and Hired just laughed, said, no, ain't there a rattler with me. Before Hired sat down, he walked over to the cage with all the rattlesnakes and opened it up and reached in and grabbed two by the back of their heads. When Howard lifted them up, they stretched plumb to the floor. Them stakes had to be every bit of five to six foot long. The whole dang restaurant went to ooing and a awing. Howard did a little dance with them rattlers just a wiggling, then he put them back in their cage and locked down the lid. People was a saying it was the dangest thing they ever saw. Now when Howard stared them rattlers dead in the eye, they didn't even make to bite him. I just had a way with critters. They just knowed somehow he wasn't going to hurt them, so they didn't try to hurt him. Now that manager was plumb Google-eyed over the show and wanted to know if and hired would come back and do it again. <laughs> he would hire him to do it every night and pay him well. Well, hired told him he appreciated the offer, but he was only in town for the day. The manager said he was welcome any time, and his and money wasn't no good here for him and the boys. The food was good, and after dessert, the captain told Leonard and Thomasina he needed to have a private talk with them. Well, Leonard took them out to Thomasina's people, where it was absolutely private. They went into a teepee and had their own little powwow and smoked the pipe to start off the meeting. Now, the smoke of the pipe was offered to all four directions, north, south, east, and west. The four winds are born from the north, south, east, and west, extolled Leonard. All the boys looked at each other and thought of their new name for their imprint enterprises. Was it a coincidence or fate? Images of Julian and Black Kettle and the dog soldiers come to mind for each of the boys and they knew. It wasn't a coincidence. After the ceremony, Leonard asked Jesse to tell him what he wanted him to do. Well, Jesse explained everything to Leonard and Thomasina and said the plan just wasn't going to work without the help of Leonard building Paul. With their assets and influence in world markets, the whole group would be autonomous. Jesse told Leonard all about Mr. Holmes, or at least as much as he could, and said they had a fighting chance to get this done and make a real difference in the world. Buster, Walter, and Hired all put in their two cents worth. Walter said, you know about all that carrying on we done went through, and Hired said to remember him of finding him in the desert, and Buster said not to forget old black cattle and the dog soldiers. There is something to all this is all I can say, says Buster. Well, Leonard and Thomas Cena agreed on the spot and said to give them the papers to sign. But Jesse said he appreciated their faith and trust and give them the guarantee of the gold that was backing up the whole shebang. Now, y'all, I got to warn you, said Jesse. There's bound to be fireworks coming from all this. You got to be real careful and on the lookout every second. Mr. Holmes has assigned Dalton, Devane, and Uncle Jeff to keep an eye on us, so just be prepared is all. To be honest, Leonard, I'm not real sure who the buzzards are that would want to take us out, but I do have some idea who might be involved. Along with Mr. Holmes, I think we can smoke them out. I know both y'all have agreed to go along with us, but I want to give you the chance to back on out of this deal. Well, Thomasina spoke up first and told the boys in no uncertain terms, that they was with them all the way. And of course, Leonard agreed. 
Well, Jesse said that there's one other big hill to climb, and that was getting Bill and Paul on board. With them, it was a done deal. Would Leonard and Thomasina fly up to Seattle with them in the morning and meet with Bill and Paul, asked Jesse. Well, Leonard looked at Thomasita and then said, If you're waiting on us, you're backing up. Well, Hired said they'd leave in the morning after breakfast. Well, that night, Hired got a call that his and Grandma was near about nine and he needed to come home and be real quick about it. She had to have a blood transfusion and a bone marrow match and they figured Hired might be it. Well, Hired left out with Jake and the Duchess and said he would keep the boys informed on what all was going on. If all was working out and his and Grandma was going to make it, he would hot foot it on up to Seattle and be with the boys and help out in the meeting. Well, Leonard and Thomasina and the boys left after breakfast as planned for Seattle. Buster and Rob flew the lady and made it in less than three hours. Leonard called to Hayden and set it up to meet with Bill and Paul that afternoon and have supper with them that night. The boys at Leonard and Thomasina would fly back to Denver the next morning. Well, the meeting went smooth and unexpected. Bill and Paul both agreed something had to be done, and it was a great plan, especially with the assistance of Mr. Holmes. They signed the documents and was ready to proceed any time Jesse gave the word. Again, Jesse told them all that uh, the trouble was a brewing and to be careful. Like the only ones they could trust was each other and Mr. Holmes, Dalton, Devane, and Uncle Jeff. If they give the okay and send someone else to help, they will give you the password, Huvehe, for a man, or Huvese Ojo for a woman. That's their engine language. Well, everybody had a real nice supper and met the wives of Bill and Paul and thoroughly enjoyed each other's company. Buster filled them all in on the party coming up and said Elizabeth Jane would be in touch and make all arrangements. Bill and Paul said not to bother with sending the plane because they had their own. The next morning on the way back to Denver, the captain spoke with Mr. Holmes and told him they would be in Washington tomorrow. The captain told Mr. Holmes he had all the documents signed and ready to go and we'd bring them with him. Well, that was in Washington, D.C., Mr. Holmes' office. They're talking about that Washington, not the state. Over the Win uh, Wenatchee National Forest near Yakima, Washington, the lady experienced engine trouble. First, the left engine quit and caught a fire after a loud pop was heard. Then the right engine just blew plumb apart. The third engine sputtered but maintained enough power for Buster and Rob to land the lady on Bear Canyon Road. It was mighty rough on the lady and everybody on the plane too. Well, Rob broke his an arm and the captain got a nasty gash on his and Hayden cheek. Thomasina and Leonard had a few minor cuts and bruises but was otherwise okay. Walter and Buster was just shook up from all of the bouncing around on the rough gravel road. That much of nothing to them. Well, after everybody got out the plane, Buster and Walter made sure she wasn't going to catch a fire and blow. The smoke from the fire and the engines made it so a body couldn't stay in the plane, least while well, still it cleared out. Well, Buster and Walter took to a splint in Rob's arm when they all heard a helicopter coming up over the mountain. Some darn fool was hanging out the side door. They come up fast and then Walter seed the machine gun. Walter hollered to take cover. Everybody got down off the side of the road up under some big boulders just before they let loose an opening fire. They just riddled the lady. Well, after two more passes, the helicopter left for a bit. During that time, Buster and Walter run to the plane to the baggage compartment. Their guns, ammo, and survival gear was there, uh, plus a life raft. Buster got everybody ready and Walter got the gear in the raft and in the water by the time the helicopter come back. The machine gun uh, feller was strafing the plane and that's when she blew. Everybody was in the raft by that time and Walter said there was a bend in the river and an outcrop at the hide under and they hated for that. Now on the fifth pass, the killers left. The plane was ablazing and caught the forest to fire. There was no choice but to hate on down river to safety. Dusk was on them and Buster tied up for the night and everybody went to attending to themselves and others that needed help. Now, Walter broke out some emergency rations and Buster inventoried their fire pyre. Now the captain said the fat was in the fire now, that's for sure. The one thing the captain saved was his briefcase and satellite phone. 
He wasn't about to lose them signed documents, no way. The captain tried to call Mr. Holmes, but the battery was too low. The captain had a solar-powered battery charger in his briefcase, but he had to wait till the sun come up to get the phone charged up enough to call out. Well, Rob wasn't hurting, and Tomasita gave him what they had to help with the pain, which wasn't much. Tylenol PM was about all, and two hydrocodone tablets that were left over from Hired's bad tooth. Well, everybody got settled in for the night, but all agreed the killers would be back to finish the job in the morning. Well, at first light, the captain got a hold of Mr. Holmes and let him know of the pickle they was in. He said the cavalry was on the way. Well, after that, the captain called Hired and asked him if he could fly. Now, Hired said he could. The captain said to bring Star and open her up. Hired could get here faster than anybody and had firepower. The captain told Hired he was going to have to take out the killers. They was trying to kill them all over there. Well, Hired Roger that. Hired told the captain he'd refuel in Boise, Idaho in record time and be there ready for a fight. Well, Hired radioed to Hayde and had fuel trucks lined up for a fast refueling stop. He also called Mr. Holmes to clear the way for him to get to the boys. Well, Mr. Holmes said consider it done, and Dalton, Devane, and Uncle Jeff was on their way but couldn't get there as fast as he could. Well, Mr. Holmes told Hired just get a lock on them and don't worry about nothing but saving the boys. It has to be done. Well, Hired said he was good with that. Ain't no bunch of killers going to kill his and brothers and friends without him doing something about it. Well, Hired had Star maxed out at Mach 1.7 with the load. He got the refueling done in record time, too. When Hired honed in on the signal the captain was giving him, he seed the helicopter strafing the riverbank trying to kill all of them in the raft. Well, lucky for him that the overhang was far enough back to keep him from them 50 caliber bullets are tearing up Jack. Hired made the flyby and rolled Old Star for a lock and load. Well, Hired acquired the target and fired the missile. The helicopter disintegrated in a burst of flames and landed in the river. But that wasn't a half of it. Two more helicopters with a landing with ground forces about to make the kill. That wasn't going to happen, I'm telling you. Hired come in with them Gatlins of spitting lead like a hailstorm in July. Well, Hired took out the helicopters and most of the men, but a few was already out and after bustering the rest of them. Reckon they was in for a little surprise, I'm telling you. Well, Buster took the high ground with his 308 Remington sniper rifle, and Walter had a combat automatic shotgun and his old snake pistol. Well, Buster left his in Glock 40 millimeter with the captain, and Leonard had Howard's Glock 9 millimeter, and they were all ready for the fight. They came at them fast and furious now, I'm telling you. Buster got one right betwixt the eyes and a head shot, and one in the leg hiding behind the rock. Four of them rushed the raft, and the captain and Leonard popped a cap or two uh, on two of them dead center. Walter was lucky. One feller sneaked up behind him and was about to get him when Thomasina hollered to look out. Well, Walter stuck the shotgun between his and legs and pulled the trigger. <laughs> boy, boy. It just near about tore that feller in two, which he deserved it. The other one was a, right, a mite slower, and Walter stitched him with three rounds from head to toe. The Thomasina see the killer they didn't spot before, and he was about to shoot Leonard. The Thomasina grabbed Walter's snake pistol out of his and belt and shot him right in the kisser. He wasn't about to shoot her husband, no sir, she wouldn't have none of that. That engine gal, <laughs> she showed him what you made of. She told Walter later that she sure liked that snake pistol and just had to get herself one of them. Well, Walter told her to just keep it. He had another and back home. She thanked Walter and hugged his neck while he reddened up like a right pl <laughs> plum and apple. <laughs> Lord, that boy you had to get a hold of him. He, he, Lou Ann to get a hug him and a kiss him on him. But now, it worked not long uh, till Dalton, Devane, and Uncle Jeff got there. They cleaned up the mess and took care of the police. Vane said he was going to have a little talk with the killer that Buster shot in the leg when they got back to headquarters. Now the boys knowed how that was going to turn out. Take no prisoners, but he going to talk. Devane didn't play around when it come to fellers trying to put out their lights. Devane would get whatever information the feller had and he'd be glad to tell Devane everything he knowed. Well, Hired waggled his wings and hated for Washington. 
He'd been in contact with Mr. Holmes. He told Howard to land at the private base he uh, controlled over there. The boys, Leonard and Thomasina, would be long after they got transportation with Dalton Devane and Uncle Jeff. Rob was sent to a medical facility to be treated and debriefed and then sent on home. A few hours later, all of them met up with Mr. Holmes. And a sure enough confab was on. What a palaver. Part 2. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, Miss Ollinger had been up early baking for Ms. Holmes since her ma had been in the hospital. Ms. Holmes had been sitting with her ever since they took her in. Now, Ms. Ollinger had called Ms. McBrayer and told her she would pick her up to go to Buster's grandma's. Now, Buster's grandma's name was Clara, and all the boys' ma's had known each other before the boys was even born. Well, Ms. McBrayer had made a casserole go along with Ms. Ollinger's apple cobbler to take to the Holmes family. Grandma Clara baked fresh bread and told the women folk to have breakfast with her before they left on out to go to the Holmes place. Well, Grandma Clara was just finishing up pouring off the bacon grease to save for later when the women come up. Grandma had made up some eggs and fresh blueberry and pecan pancakes along with some homemade sausage and smoked bacon. Peach jam and honey was served up with fresh churn butter for the bread she just baked. Coffee and milk from the morning milking was put on the table for the ladies to drink. They could also have hot tea. Whilst they were eating breakfast, Miss Ollinger mentioned that Mr. Ollinger had seen a feller a skulking around the ranch whilst him and old Ike, and that's their oldest boy, was a checking on the cattle yesterday morning. They hollered at the feller, but he took to a running. Well, Ike sicked his and hound on the feller and got a good chunk out of him before he jumped in the back of a pickup and the feller driving peeled out just to throwing dirt and gravel. Well, funny you should say that, said Ms. McBrayer. My Jesse was out to the compressor station on the pipeline day before yesterday, and two fellers was on the hillside with field glasses scoping out him in the place. Reason he seen them was he was a-checking up and down the pipeline with his and binoculars and spied them up on the hill. When Jesse said they lit a shot, when they was spotted, now Jesse is Jesse Darrell's daddy, and they called him Mac. Now, ain't that a coincidence, said Grandma Clara. Gus was a working on a plow over by the barn at the farm when he seen the feller in a SUV outside the north side back out of sight. When Gus went to see what the feller was a doing, he heard something in the barn. He went in and caught a feller a rummaging around. Well, Gus got in a tussle with the feller and whooped him proper like, he said. When the feller got up, he run out the far end to the door and Jumped in and got in that SUV and them two lit out fast. Gus said he'd recognize them if he seen them again. Well, all the women figured something was going on for sure, especially since they ain't heard from the boys. They decided to gather up at the Hollinger place after the men got in from work and they was through helping out at the Holmes place. They know Shirley was plumb tuckered out with what all she done been through with her mama. When the ladies got to the home place and left the food, they then went on over to the hospital. By the time they got away from there, it was coming on to supper time. Now, Miss Ollinger asked them if they would come on over to their place because of the men pushing the cattle to the pens, and they wasn't going to stop till they got there. It'd be around about six in the evening or so. The lady said that'd be just fine because it would give them time to get on out there to their ranch. Miss Ollinger said supper would be on the table and awaiting when they got there. Of course, you know, both Ms. McBrayer and Grandma Clara was going to bring something for dessert at least. Well, all the families gathered up at the Ollinger's like was planned and had a real good supper. Grandpa Gus called Mr. Jim Holmes and asked him if he couldn't drop on by for a little serious talking. Well, Big Jim said he'd be there, but Shirley was going to stay at the hospital with her mama. Well, all the folks went into the living room, and Mr. McBrayer started off by telling what he knowed about the fellers a skulking around their places. Grandpa Gus and Mr. Ollinger and I told what all they knowed as well. They all agreed something was up, and they ain't heard nary a word nor seen hide nor hair of their boys. Well, Mr. McBrayer said that Jesse said something about calling Mr. Hired Holmes if there was a problem. Well, since they was at the Ollinger place, Mr. Ollinger called Mr. Holmes in Washington to find out if there was any news about their boys. 
Well, sure enough, the phone didn't ring twice before we done picked it up. Well, Mr. Hollinger told Mr. Holmes all the families was together and they was a calling about the boys. Well, Mr. Holmes said they was with him and all of them was okay. Well, Mr. Holmes said he would put all of them on his speakerphone so they could all talk and hear. Well, Mr. Hollinger didn't know if they had a speaker or not, but Ike jumped up and hit a button that turned it on. Well, Mr. Hollinger said, ain't that the darndest thing? Didn't know we had that. Well, Grandpa Gus piped up and said they done had a spot of trouble, but it was handled so fur. Well, Mr. Holmes wanted to know all about that, and all the men folk told what they knowed, and Big Jim Holmes spoke up and said somebody, his and men didn't know, come up around his shop and wanted their jobs too. Then Mr. Holmes got down to business with the families, Mr. Hiram that is. He warned them about the possibility of kidnapping one of the family or some of all of the families. He had just dispatched agents to come out there for each family as he spoke. Well, Mr. Holmes proceeded to tell all about the attack on the boys and hire to come into the rescue. Jesse was just fine except an, a cut on his and forehead and cheek. Leonard and Thomasina was sitting on back to Denver with agents and was going to lay low out at the reservation for a spell. Jim and Marion Rogers was informed along with Bill and Paul and Aunt Judith. Now, Mr. Holmes assigned 20 men to Aunt Judith along with Alfred, Alfred and Horace and had her get in touch with all the clan round about tell them they was needed again. Of course, Alfred and Horace just loved their tomatoes with Aunt Judith and Maureen and Colleen are cooking. They just loved their cooking. Could eat their weight, they said. Bill and Paul had their own security force along with agents sent by Mr. Holmes. Now, Leonard and Thomasina didn't have no worry because them killers would have to take on the whole dad burn reservation. The Indians was ready to go on the war path, I'm a telling you. Reckon that Jim and Marion had the best of it with their secret mountain and super security. They had to be found first, but Marion and Jim was laying low till they heard from Mr. Holmes or the boys. Well, all the necessary precautions have been taken, said Mr. Holmes, for everybody's safety. He asked everybody to stay in till the agents got there and to get well armed. Well, Mr. Holmes let the boys all talk to their folks and told them they'd be back when they could, but they was into something that had to be took care of. Well, all the folks knowed all about the situation the boy had been in and trusted Mr. Holmes to a fault. Well, Mr. Holmes said Uncle Jeff was coming in to inform them all what all was going on and then fly back out. All the family said they'd be available no matter what time he got there. And Mr. Holmes said to expect Uncle Jeff in about two hours. Hired was going to fly him in and back out in the star. The boys said their goodbyes and hung up. All the folks decided just to stay at the Ollingers till Uncle Jeff and Hired got there. Big Jim Holmes made a call to Shirley and told her where he would be and told his and other two youngins, Jamie and June, to go over and pick up the McBrayer gals, Diane and Sandy, and for all of them to come on out to the Ollinger ranch. Well, when Jamie drove in, he come straight into the house and told his and Paul that some darn fool liked to have run them off into the ditch. Then they tried to hit their back bumper. Jamie said he put the truck in four-wheel drive and come across the low ground on the backside of the north pasture of the Ollinger place. The fellers that tried to stop them couldn't go there because they didn't know the country or have a four-wheel drive. Well, that done it. Ain't nobody leaving here till Uncle Jeff gets here, said Mr. Ollinger and the other men folk. All right, you break out the rifles and shotguns, hollered Mr. Ollinger. Well, the women folk put on a couple of pots of coffee and the girls went to Carla May and Mary Gale's room to listen to records. All the boys stayed right close, made sure all the guns was loaded and there was plenty of ammunition. Now, all of them wasn't wondering just what in the world was going on, but no day wasn't going to know for sure till Uncle Jeff got in there with Hired. They all just hunkered down for the wait with their minds just erasing. Part 3 well, Uncle Jeff and Hired got into the airport in just under two hours. All the folks was waiting on pins and needles and wanting to know what all had been happening and what was happening. First off, Hired had to tell all the folks about what all happened when he flew out to the star uh, to save the boys. The folks were just plum mortified. Now, Ms. McBrayer said, you mean to tell us they was planning on killing all y'all in cold blood? Well, that's about the size of it, said Hired. 
Well, Mr. Ollinger asked Uncle Jeff, her very own brother, what this was all about. Well, this is about a plan Jesse and Mr. Holmes had about making a difference in the world and securing the future of all the families and friends of the boys. As y'all know, they have done real well about making money even though ain't none of them flaunts it. Y'all know ain't none of us be included as wanted for anything in quite a spout. Well, Jesse and Mr. Holmes have a plan to put their assets and assets of their friends and associates into play for putting America back on the gold standard. By having their own private bank and secure locations as a storehouse for a massive amount of gold plus other precious metals and gemstones and technology and other valuables. <coughs> Excuse me folks. They are putting up a place where folks with money can be assured that they can get it anytime they want and that it will be worth about what it was worth when they put it in. It puts the Federal Reserve out of business. Private bankers are just having a hissy fit because they will lose trillions of dollars and most of all control of the United States and other countries. Now if that don't put a burr under their saddle, between Mr. Holmes and the boys they have amassed somewhere around 300 trillion dollars. This made up about 13 trillion that is liquid that being gold and such, and the rest in in-ground assets. The fellers that have been deviling y'all are probably trying to kidnap as many of you as they can to hold you for up for ransom. Hold that over Jesse and the boys to give all the documents they have signed to them. Now those documents pledge and sign over control of all the wealth of certain folks. Heck fire, now even the Arabs want to give their money to the plan as Mr. Holmes tells it. Now, Big Jim Holmes spoke up and asked Howard how he was feeling about having to take out all them fellers with the star. Now, Big Jim knowed Howard had a soft heart for living things and was worse than how Howard was holding up. Howard said, Pa, I do respect the life of all things, but it was evil that was trying to overcome good. I know the Lord would want me to save the boys and the others no matter what it took. I'd do it again a hundred times over. Oh, Big Jim smiled at his and shy and understanding way, put his and arm around his and son. Big Jim said, I'm sure enough proud of you, son. And all the others agree. Well, Uncle Jeff went on to tell the whole story of what happened with the attack and the part each of the boys played in the fight. Now, Uncle Jeff went on to tell the folks about Leonard and Thomasina, Bill and Paul, and Aunt Judith too. He gave a strict warning of being careful and got all the young'uns' attention in solemn word not to disobey their folks or what he was telling them. He said, y'all may want to sneak out to see a boy or a gal or walk off by yourself, but don't do nothing like that till we tell you different. Don't even go to the outhouse by yourself or feed the chickens or milk the cow. Always go armed to the teeth, too. Now, Mr. Holmes has agents getting in place right now for your protection, but they can't do that less than y'all help them. These men are super dangerous. The fellas behind all this have an army all their own. They have a mercenary force better equipped and trained than most countries except in ours and another in the two. These hired killers are just that, killers. They will have no mercy on you. Now the reason Mr. Holmes sent me and hired in person is so y'all will believe what he's a telling you. All y'all know we have been in some scrapes before, but they ain't nothing compared to what we're in now. As much as Mr. Holmes needs me and hired back in Washington right now, it was more important to come here. Appears like we come just in the nick of time. It's a wonder somebody ain't been took or killed by them. Well, Uncle Jeff had each Ma and Paul stand up beside him and ask their young'uns if they swore to do as they were being told and warned to do. Uncle Jeff said there just wasn't no way this plan would work if one of them was used as a hostage in a bargaining piece. Even if Jesse and Mr. Holmes did give up the documents and the plan, they'd be killed anyhow. All of them would, just exterminated. Well, to a person, young and old, they swore to do as they was asked to do for their family, friends, and themselves. Well, good enough, said Uncle Jeff. 
I want y'all to all stay in this here house till our people get here and in place. Is that a problem? No siree, said Miss Ollinger. We'll make do. Well, all the folks said to tell the boys they was praying for them and loved them more than anything. And they said to tell Mr. Holmes they knowed he would do what was best and they supported anything he had to do. Had them to do. And anything he said to do. Well, Grandpa Gus told Uncle Jeff to tell Dalton and Devane him and Grandma was depending on them taking care of Buster and the rest of the boys. The other Miles and Pauls and family seconded that and sent their best and prayers for them too. Well, tell all of them to be as careful as they can, said Mary Gale. And I and Melvin volunteered to go with them. Well, Uncle Jeff said he needed all of them here to take care of things, but if they was needed, he'd call them. Well, Uncle Jeff called Grandpa Gus, Mr. McBrayer, Mr. Ollinger, and Big Jim Holmes to the side before him and I had left out. He told the men that this was more than just serious and that he might have to have them help out some. Well, Mr. Holmes knowed their metal and could trust them, and that was why he was even mentioning it. This fracas is plumb global, and to tell the truth, Mr. Holmes and none of the rest of us knows where it'll go. Well, Mr. Holmes has pulled out all the stops, and y'all will be hearing all sorts of things in the news, but don't pay no never mind unless one of us tell it so. I'll tell you this, said Uncle Jeff, there are going to be a lots of haids that are going to roll. This is a war. Just keep everybody together as much as possible for right now, even if it means no schooling or working. This will all play out pretty soon, but make the best of it till then. Well, Uncle Jeff said he was more worried about the young'uns than anybody because they were just kids and figured they could get away with anything. But these fellers are not just regular bad guys. These men are vicious. I can't tell you the terrible things I know that they have done. I mean it, men. Keep an eye peeled and shoot first and ask questions later. Trust no one. Hear what I'm saying? Because it's for true. Paul said, Hired, you got to do what you can with Ma and Grandma. They're vulnerable over at the hospital. Well, Big Jim said he'd take care of that tonight. All the men shook Uncle Jeff's hand and said to tell Mr. Holmes he could count on them. As Hart and Uncle Jeff was leaving, all the folks come outside and waved goodbye and said good luck and we love you. Them knowing that they may never see their boys or kin again. As Uncle Jeff and Hire drove out of sight, there was gunfire and the barn was ablaze. Part 4 well, Mr. Ollinger called to Miss Ollinger and said, Evelyn, call the neighbors and volunteer firemen at the firehouse in town too. All you boys get a gun. Don't go running outside, Ike. Melvin, y'all see to the stop. Jamie, you stay here and guard the gals. All right, men. Let's just take her easy, said Grandpa Gus. We all know this is a trap. Big Jim, come with me. Herman, you and Mac take the left side and we'll take the right. Ladies, cover the front first. Mr. Ollinger said we may lose the barn, but it's better than losing a life. Everybody ready? Let's go. When Malvin and I got to the barn, they seed that there wasn't much chance of saving the stock in the barn unless they could get them out from the stalls. Now Malvin jumped on the tractor that had a bucket on the front end of it and tore out the side of the barn and let out the horses. About that time they opened up with rifle fire. The men and women folk seed the muscle flashes and poured it on them. The men folk covered each other and managed to hook up the fuel wagon and butane tank and get it away from the fire. Old Melvin was driving the fool out of that there tractor, I'm telling you, all the while a-dodging bullets. Ike was a-hooking up and a-shooting too with the help of his and Paul. Well, after all the lead quit a-flying, they seed what nobody was hurt. And the barn was gone and they lost a couple of brood mares, them killer shot and some goats and sheep that was pinned up. Walter's graves got out when Melvin tore down the side of the wall of the barn and run to the south pasture. They got in the trees down by the creek and wasn't hit by any gunfire. Them dying killers was sure enough trying to shoot them horses too. Well, folks come from far and wide to help out on the fire, but eventually it died on out. It was a smoldering for a week till it finally burned out to a point that the pumper truck from town could extinguish the fire for good. 
Well, early that morning when all the folks had come to help left out, all the families got together and had a really heart-to-heart -heart talk with all of them. Now, Mr. McBrayer, old Mac, said he hoped they realized how serious this attack was. The killers were trying to get some of them and to run outside and kidnap them or just kill them. Now, I suggest that we all get some rest and then go to our houses and get what all we need to stay with the Ollingers for a spell. We'll go to one place at a time together. We won't split up and we'll go armed. The police, the county sheriff and state troopers showed up about noon the next day. Now, Mr. Holmes had called them and then the men folk and told them what to expect. He said to use them if they could, but not to trust them a bit. Like he said, don't trust nobody, Grandma added. Sure enough, while Sandy McBrayer was packing her belongings, a state trooper tried to get her to go with him in his car. She said no, but he was being right insistent till Mr. McBrayer come up and asked what was going on here. The trooper said he was just trying to help, but when they left back to the Ollinger Ranch, he was never seen again. Well, Mr. Holmes was in constant contact with the folks and was informed of what all was happening. One of Mr. Holmes' agents spotted the feller posing as a state trooper, and him and another agent caught him and when he was leaving town. The feller got bunged up a bit when they shot out his tires and he wrecked his car, but they got him. A plane took him back to headquarters to have a little visit with Devane. Take no prisoners, but he got the information. Things quieted down after that, but all was not so in Kentucky, Seattle, or Denver. Part 5. Now, when Uncle Jeff and Hired got back to Washington, the first thing was Walter asking if and Hired brung his another snake pistol. So we're dead, picked it up as I was a leaving, then Hired gave it to Walter. Walter said he was feeling a mite naked without it. Now, Mr. Holmes had all the boys in Dalton, Devane, and Uncle Jeff meet up with him in the conference room of his office. He told them all about the attack on the Ollinger Ranch and the killer trying to kidnap Sandy McBrayer posing as a state trooper. He was caught and being brought back to be interrogated by Devane. Well, after Devane got done with that, they was all going to meet again tomorrow night and discuss what all needed to be done. Now, Uncle Jeff gave them all a rundown on what all went on with the meeting of the families. Hired told the boys that the family said they all loved them and was praying for them, their safety and all, and wanted to volunteer to go after the scoundrels up to all this mischief. They was plumb vile trying to kill his and Gray, said Walter. It was glad Melvin and Ike got them out of harm's way. Well, them horses are plumb some kind of smart, said Hired. They dodged all the bullets being fired at them and went straight to the trees down by the creek and hid in them. When it was all over and done, they come back to the house and just went to a grazing like nothing happened. Well, the next morning, the boys found out about the coordinated attacks on Leonard and Thomasina, Bill and Paul, and Aunt Judith. Reckon old Black Kettle didn't have to show up this time because the dog soldiers on the reservation killed about 20 or so of the mercenaries trying to get Leonard and Thomasina. Aunt Judith had so many agents and kin watching over her that when they come for her, they got an unsuspected surprise. Seven of the mercenaries were wounded and captured. Eight more were killed. Devane and his and work cut out for him, getting all the information from the varmints, but he got it all. Now, Bill and Powell was another matter. Their security force wasn't no match for the mercenaries, and Mr. Holmes' agents couldn't hold them all off by themselves. They lost four men and four more were wounded. The rest of the baker's dozen that was left described the mercenaries as the most cruel and vicious killers they ever seed, and that's going some. What all they described to Mr. Holmes and Dalton and Devane, the boys didn't know, but it must have been bad. Real bad. And I can't even begin to tell you everything they did. Plum pitiful. Nothing human about them. They as bad as them lizards. Dalton generally just didn't know no feeling, nor did Devane, but they got toasted on that old McGrayer that night. The boys over here at Devane say they would rue the day he met up with them. That was a promise to those men he served with. Dalton just scowled at his and eyes glazed over. Paul's wife was kidnapped along with his and three-year-old daughter and his and mother-in-law. Now this was skipping a cog in the gears. Paul was beside his himself. 
Now, Mr. Holmes had Paul and Bill brought to Washington and had a set tea with them and the boys too. Mr. Holmes said he would move heaven and earth to get them back, but Paul just had to know there wasn't going to be much hope in that. Those men just didn't plan to let any of them live, even his and three-year-old daughter. They will do anything to get to you, Paul, and if you go along with them, you know they will kill them and you too. We have to make hay here, but expect the worst. The best thing you can do is go forwards. I know it hurts, but this is pretty hopeless as I see it. Dalton and Devane asked if they could leave right away and get on the case. Mr. Holmes said at first that he needed them here and them lead the attack on the leaders of the bunch. Dalton and Devane said, hire them, we're going to go. We will stay in constant touch, but we're going to go. This is the very first time y'all have ever questioned what I ordered, Mr. Holmes said. Well, Mr. Holmes looked at him for a minute whilst the thinking, I know y'all have your reasons and would not put the operation in jeopardy unless you know you could handle it. Go, but remember, we have a lot of stake here, and we need y'all to make this work. We'll be back, Dalton said, and they left on out. Well, later on, Buster and the boys went out to the Roosevelt Park that evening, and Walter lit a fire. Walter went to meditating and calling on help and guidance. Hired found a snake of some kind and started doing a little jig around the fire with the snake. After all of them was about tuckered out, then Julian stepped up between the boys in front of the fire and said, Good evening, boys. Well, all the boys not to, know not to even ask how or where he come from or how he got there, but just to listen. Julian said he knew about Paul's women folk being captured and he was there to help. The atrocity being committed on the people that stand in their way is your old nemesis, the Illuminati. It's beyond belief. It not only is happening to your folks here, but round about the world. They will do anything to get what they want. We cannot let that happen, boys. Y'all just don't have no idea what kind of danger you're in. Same goes for Mr. Holmes. He ain't bulletproof, you know. Well, the names of the 13 families that make up the secret government of the New World Order are what you have already been told. They will do everything in their immense power to stop the plan Mr. Holmes and Jesse have started. The plan would be the start of the downfall uh, of the Illuminati, and they figure they are better than anybody else and should be the rulers of the world. An organized and thoroughly planned attack must be made to take out as many of the heads of the families as possible by any means necessary. Boys, go and have a meeting with Hiram Holmes and tell him what I said. Also tell him that several members in government and the Congress will have to be dealt with too. Walter said Dalton and Devane had blood in their eye and was on their way to help out the women folk of Paul's. They just couldn't sit by and do nothing. They had to go on and help no matter what it took. You got to, you got to stop them boys. They're loaded for bar, but they is going into this half cocked. It's going to take a little doing to get them women out to fix their end. Here's how I want you to tell Dalton, Dalton and Devane to do it. There's a place called Shaw Island off the coast of Washington, and they're holed up there with the women on a private compound. It is heavily wooded, with open views to the water access. The place is heavily guarded and rigged to blow if breached. They don't care. The Franciscan nuns run the ferry, and that would be a way to sneak in a few agents. The underwater team could come in at night and be coordinated with the ferry as it stays open till 2 a.m. The demolition boys will have to work fast to disarm the explosives. They have the technology for that. The women can be rescued from the west end of the house on the second floor. Tell Dalton when the women are free to take out the whole compound. Take no prisoners. The mercenaries have no more information to be any use to you. Now before Julian left, he touched Jesse's head and cheek, and the cut on both the head and the cheek was healed instantly. Part 
six. Well, Jesse, between your contacts and mine, we've got the support of the seven traders of the four traditional trade groups in the world. But we have to neutralize the Illuminati to get that support, said Mr. Holmes. We both know Simpson in London is old and about to step down, but he never was in the inner circle of the Illuminati. He is smart enough to know that he is disposable and just uh, has been used all along. They know which side of their bread they're buttered on. Some of those men are trustworthy and some are not, but money is their motivation and power. If we can pull off this plan, it will be there to their benefit. Now, Mr. Holmes said he could make sure that POTUS would not change anything in the Marshall Plan from World War II. Business as usual, if he wants to finish out his in turn. Boys, this is going to be the most secret operation ever undertaken by me and the Presidential Corps. There are going to be all kinds of folks kicking up daisies before this is over and done with. Outright murder. Of course, they deserve it. Heart attacks, suicides, accidents, and assassination will happen all over the world at the same time. This is the only way to cut off the hate off a snake. This is something you're going to have to live with till your dying day. This is war. Can you do it, or do y'all want to go on back home, Master Mr. Holmes? Well, the boys all looked at each other, and one voice said, We're staying. How Mr. Holmes had come into contact with Julian was beyond the boys. But he had, and he did from time to time, he said, come in contact with him. Mr. Holmes took the report the boys gave him from Julian and put it into action immediately. Walter called Dalton and Devane his himself and told him to hold on for a minute and listen to what all he had to say. The speed of trust, boys. Y'all know what I wouldn't say it if it wasn't so. Get the women this way and it'll work. Going in blind like you are will get everybody killed. Well, Dalton and Devane had got their heads clear by that time and listened to reason and said the plan was sound. They got everything in place for the early morning rendezvous and was set to go. The mission was set for 2 a.m. when the ferry stopped running. The phone call come telling Paul if and he wanted his family back alive that he would revoke his signed document and transfer all his assets to the Illuminati. The exchange was for him to come alone to Anna Cortes at 6 a.m. the following morning. They warned him that if anyone else showed up, they would kill them all. Paul said he'd be there, alone. The mission began at 2.23 a.m., right after the last nun left the ferry and went home. The vein went in from the west side that was heavily wooded, and Dalton led his team from the east side waterfront. The other team leaders came in from the north and south sides. It was silent till one of the sentries got off a short burst from his machine pistol whilst he was a being knifed by one of the commandos. All hell broke loose then. Devane went in through a second story window and seen a big bruiser fixing to kill the women. Devane had a look in his and eye that would stop an eight day clock, I'm telling you. He killed the mercenary with his in bare hands. His being expert in Pencac's lat didn't allow the mercenary the chance of a snowball in Hades. The little girl was in the next room and was a screaming. Devane told the women to go with the commandos, and they repelled out the window and was took off into the woods. Devane seen a feller that was about to do some awful things to the little girl of Paul's. Devane didn't shoot the pervert, but scared him with his an EK Commando FSMK2 knife. Devane wrapped up the little girl and covered her hay and gave her to one of his men to take out. Devane then returned to the man with Devane's knife stick out of his and belly. Devane leaned over the man and said, they don't call me the executioner for nothing. Then Devane put the man through some kind of mortal misery and pain before he died. Devane told him that this was his and price to pay for what all he done to his and friends and comrades and all the other people he killed and tortured. The man died slow. He took his and last breath when the house blew into a million pieces with a fireball a hundred foot high. There was a price to pay for the mission, but it was worth it. Paul's mother-in-law got the worst of it because she was old and couldn't get around real good. Fast wasn't out of the, fast was out of the question. 
The few scrapes and bruises running through the woods wasn't nothing compared to what would have happened to them. X-ray showed she, the mother-in-law had fractured her hip when she fell and one of the commandos had to tow her out. The doctor said she had been fine in order to be up and at them in a month or two. Paul and Bill's families were put under heavy guard of Mr. Holmes agent along with their security force. No one was allowed out of their compound. No one was allowed in unless specifically authorized by Mr. Holmes. There was no question his and orders was going to be followed. Paul's little girl was getting over her frightfulness real quick. A child's resilience is a wonder, and along with a little professional help, she was doing fine. Paul told Devane he would never forget what he'd done for his and family, and he couldn't thank him and Dalton enough. Devane said, ain't no thanks necessary. Well, things were coming to a haid real quick. Mr. Holmes had vast contacts and support around the world that had been cultivated for years. There was things he knew that no one else knew at all, not even the president. It wasn't going to take much longer for the fireworks to start, Mr. Holmes said. Just a matter of days. We're going to take it to them and see how they like it. This time, good will overcome evil. Well, the boys helped out wherever they was needed, and Hired Buster was asked to fly missions and jets procured by Mr. Holmes. Only men Mr. Holmes trusted was involved in the mission. The U.S. Armed Forces was out of the picture. Some of the intelligence agencies would participate, but very few were privy to what was going to take place. Finally, four days later, D-Day arrived. Part 7. The news had a heyday of reporting all the killings, accidents, heart attacks, and suicides going on with important people around the world. Seemed like bedlam was everywhere. The whole administration and most of Congress were thrown into a tizzy with deaths, deaths from all kinds of causes and resignations of people in high places. Terrorists, drug cartels, and organized crime was blamed for most of the killings in different places around the world. Well, Mr. Holmes had Buster and Fly hired Fly several sorties against strongholds of the Illuminati in Europe. Germany, France, and London was the main targets. They sure wiped out a bunch of folks, all of them deserving and meaner than a yard dog. Coordinated attacks and just plain walking up to members of the Illuminati and killing them was done quicker than a cat could cover it up. CIA operatives used plastic guns with ice crystals rustic acid on door handles and ricin to get a bunch of them. A lot of other stuff too. Now the Illuminati didn't take all this laying down now. They tried their dangers to kill Mr. Holmes and the boys using everything short of a nuclear bomb. They tried suicide bombers, letter bombs, biological agents and water and other mean and dirty tricks. Well during all this fighting all the folks and friends had moved to the converted missile silo in Washington. Everybody come except in Jim and Marion. Convoys of gold and other valuables was already being shipped to the silo and secured. Walter and Buster went on several raids with Dalton and Devane, and Jesse helped coordinate the plans with Mr. Holmes. Well, Hired stayed behind to do any flying that was necessary and to help out at the silo. Now, Shirley Holmes and her ball was brought to the silo too under heavy guard. Her ball was better and could be moved, and now they was all together. Doctors was brung in to care for the folks there too. The only ones that was real fractious was old uh, Barry Brown and Gary Ashland. You know when you're in love or heat a body ain't got no sense. So Mr. Ollinger had to keep a close eye on the gals in order to keep them from talking too much or putting themselves in harm's way. Well after all the initial fighting was over, things settled down from outward appearances, but got hotter than a pistol on a covert basis. The Illuminati never did think anybody would challenge them, let alone attack them in broad daylight. Well, they thought wrong. The U.S. was in the throes of change, mainly getting back to their roots. The puppets that was there was ousted or killed, and folks was putting honest and accountable folks in leadership. Well, Mr. Holmes visited the silo and had a serious talk with all of them. He said this ain't over yet and would be a long pull uphill, but the immediate danger was over and they could all go home. What was done to break the stranglehold on the U.S. economy would allow the country to heal and get solvent again, but it was going to take some work to keep it there. The boys would always be a part in that, seeing how they had so much invested in the future of the U.S. of A. 
Well, Mr. Holmes said he felt real confident that all their assets was protected and in fact four wins would have to be recognized by everybody in the financial realm in the world. The crest of the families of the boys was meaningful too. The Illuminati used the term royalty two different ways. First was what is called open royalty. That's when you're descended from royal bloodlines and the second is hidden royalty. That means they have extreme occult power. Well, make no two ways about all this. These people are pure D evil. That's why whatever you have to do to get rid of them ain't to be took badly. Killing is not what we want to do, but we have to do. All the families said they understood that more than ever now. Well, Mr. Holmes said he was a-leaving. Y'all head on home now, and I'll be in touch. Epilogue. Buster and Howard kept the Duchess, Duchess of Busy flying folks into Mount Sterling Montgomery Airport. Elizabeth Jane and the McGregors, along with the women and gals and all the boys' families, made all the arrangements for a bang-up shindy. Portable housing, limousines, bands, rental cars, all manner of food, and every kind of beverage known to man was brung in for the party. The picture show, swimming pool, skating rink, and arcade was all rented and free for the weekend for everybody. The hotel there in town, the bed and breakfast, and the little motel was rented for the weekend too for folks that wanted to stay there. Now, all the family members were staying at the house and there was room to spare. Elizabeth Jane had folks decorating and building and landscaping day and night. Now, Aunt Judith said no expense was to be spared. Even a circus was hired for the young and old alike to go to. Barbecue pits was a going full blast and cook tents was operating 24 hours a day from Thursday to Monday morning. Only the best was good enough for this here party. On Thursday folks started arriving. Meeting and a greeting and visiting went on most of the night and most folks didn't get settled in till early morning. The cook tents was going strong and people were seeing folks they ain't never seen or ain't seen in a coon's age. Folks were milling everywhere and the youngins was a having the time of their life. Friday was a fun day with all kinds of activities going on. Folks was having a wonderful time and just couldn't believe all the preparations that was made for them. Friday night, Aunt Judith had all her kin and the boys' families to supper, and they revisited old times and good memories. Aunt Judith gave each and every one of her kin a special gold medallion and a stock certificate of her part of four wins. She told them that Jesse and Buster was executors of her estate, if there was anything that they needed to just see them. Elizabeth Jane was in charge of putting together all the family tree on the Tipton McBrayer families and she asked them all to help her out as much as possible. Then Aunt Judith called over the McGregors, McGregors, Maureen and Colleen. These two women are my closest friends, she said. They've been through so much with me as I have with them in our lives. Their family and mine go back to the roots we have in Scotland. Me being a Tipton gives me great pleasure finding all my relatives here in America and in England. She then took the hands of Buster and Jesse and told them all that we were forever united and never forget the other. It was a heartwarming time, I tell you. Pictures were took by the professional photographer of each clan. Then a group picture was made of the Tiptons, McBrayers, and McGregors. Other pictures were took of the Holmes and Ollinger families and Aunt Judith told everybody, even though they weren't blood kin, that they was family. Saturday was the day that everybody that was coming was there. The only ones that couldn't make it had videos made and had sent them over to Elizabeth Jane. Lo and behold, here come Mr. Holmes, Dalton, and Devane. They come up to Aunt Judith and said they wasn't going to miss this party for nothing. What a day of fun and eating everybody had. The whole town of Mount Sterling was invited for the day and the danks that night. The old McBrayer was a flowing and I'm a telling you, Mr. Holmes danced with Aunt Judith and Elizabeth Jane and the McGregor ladies too. Elizabeth Jane had called off the wedding with the Freeman boy over in England when Mr. Holmes proved he was using her and was one of the Illuminati. She met a feller that was an educated real southern gentleman while visiting in New Orleans with, Mo with Monique. He was down to earth and a real handy feller about fixing things too. 
he pulled a tour of duty in the intelligence section of the Marines and had some uh, experience there and come back home to help his and folks on their plantation. Now the boy was checked out from A to Z by Mr. Holmes and found to be of sterling character. Of course Mr. Holmes didn't let on he done that, but all the boys know he done it. The feller's name was Bo Armand Sagne, and you could tell him and Elizabeth was heel up, head over heels in love. They was a perfect perfection when they danced. Now, all the boys had their gals there along with their families too. The whole shebang was recorded so everybody would have something to remember it by. On toward 9 o'clock.